Here's my report on the final round of the US Championship 2022. Going to that final round, Fabiano, Fabiano Caruana led the field by a half point. Now, he was playing white against Aronian, and he took no chances. Aronian, not having a great tournament, but a difficult opponent. And Caruana played into a very well-known line in the, against the Berlin. And that was the final position. There's not a lot going on there. So a draw. So that meant Caruana went into the clubhouse with a point lead. If Ray Robson could win his final game, then they would share first and they'd go into a tiebreak. Robson tried very hard to win against Jeffrey Seong, but that was the final position. There's not a lot going on there. Um, White has a rook and two pawns against Bishop and Knight. But White can make no progress. I mean, in fact, these these had been the last few moves. They repeated the position. So what about stepping forward with the king? Let's just check this. Well, in this case, the knight can just come here and take on h3. And actually, black is very safe there. So a draw. So that meant that Fabiano Caruana won the US Championship 2022. Um, I'm very pleased. I think uh, the chess world is a better place when Caruana is doing well. And he's had a bit of a dip in form recently, so I'm pleased for him. Right, which game am I going to focus on for this final round? I'd like to look at the game between Dariusz Szwierc, uh, originally from Poland. Apologies if I butchered the pronunciation. And Christopher Yu who is just 15 years old, a product of the Berkeley Chess School. So let's take a look at this game. I thought this was very interesting, actually. And it features a battle of the octopuses. Always good to see. So this is Spanish. And you goes for this, well, I was, I was going to say very modern line with bishop c5. Of course, it's an ancient variation, but it's received a lot of attention over the past 20 years and leads to really sharp positions. It's basically just risky putting the bishop outside the pawn chain because, you know, potentially a white bishop can pin here. You know, this is one of the problems. And also, black is going to lose time when that bishop gets attacked by the pawn on d4. So, you know, just for these first few moves, it feels like black is a little bit on the edge. And also a4, that's rather disruptive. Rook b8. d4, there you go, attacks the bishop. So white is gaining time. Now, one of the most popular continuations here is to exchange. And black gives up that pawn. And then bishop g4. And, and so there's pressure here, there's pressure here. Um, it, it's a really messy variation. There's, there are stacks of games played in that line. But Dariush goes for a5 instead. Also pretty well known, also very sharp. If that's taken, then white sacks the exchange and actually gets tremendous compensation there. Again, well known. So the bishop drops back to a7. So, so why is black suffering like this, you know, losing all this time? Well, it's all about putting this bishop on this potentially dangerous diagonal where there's pressure on d4, potentially pressure on f2 and the king. So it's just a more active stance, basically. h3, now that's important. We've seen that this pin could be annoying. Bishop b7. So both bishops potentially very actively placed here. Rook e1 supports the center. Bishop e3, so that's to try and block out this bishop. And this involves a pawn sacrifice. Pawn takes, pawn takes. Knight b4, so the knight activates and opens up the bishop's diagonal. And here, well, white could save the pawn by playing d5. 
And after this exchange, then c5 comes. And actually, black has a reasonable uh, counterplay there. Uh, but instead, Dariush goes for knight c3. And this involves a pawn sacrifice. Uh, I, I have a feeling the both players knew this position quite well. There have been some past games in this line, and this pawn sack is computer approved. Basically, you know, these guys playing at this high level, they don't touch an opening unless they've checked it with computers thoroughly. But it's what happens after that computer analysis ends, then it all goes a bit funny. Let's let's see. So first of all, why can't this pawn be taken like this? Well, here, white play, what do you do? Bishop d2. And that knight is in trouble. Both of these attacked. That's, that's going to be better for white. Um, there's, there have been pass games with c5, but that's also, it's a bit unclear. Suddenly that pin is a bit annoying. But Christopher Yu, obviously very well prepared, and he takes that pawn with the bishop. Now, this is quite scary. This was taken, exchanged off, and this is a key position, which I suspect Yu had done his homework better than Sviach is is my impression. So this has been seen before. Have been if you look in the database, you'll you'll find some games in this line. And in fact, Sviach follows one of these games. What would you do? What would you do here with White? I'll have a little slurp tea. White to play. How is white going to get compensation? Well, here, if you wanted to play very calmly and play rook c1, well done. So this puts a little bit of pressure on c7, takes away the c6 square from the knight. So it's a really tricky position. Both these knights are loose. And, you know, tactically that could be a problem. So, for example, if rook c8, bishop c2 attacks the knight, well, if that's exchanged off, knight is attacked here, and then the queen swoops down to c6 and... Yes, this is an extra pawn, but it's going nowhere, and that pawn is vulnerable. And this could be a lot of fun for white. Black doesn't have to go down that line. For example, king h8 is possible, so after bishop c2, attacking the knight, then f5 guards the knight. But white certainly has decent play here, because you can see these pieces, particularly the bishop on a7, just cut out a play. And th this is a tricky one. Now that knight does get back into play on d5. That's a decent square. But this is it's a very unclear position, actually. So rook c1. If you want to play rook c1, well done. Bishop f4 has been played in this position. Um, also possible, although here that work turned out better for... Black. That's a game between Hansen and Pragnananda. So you can see, you know, this position has seen some attention from strong players. And, you know, if a few people know about it, then a lot of people know about it. That's the way things work in the chess world now. Y you can be sure that if you've seen a game, then, you know, a lot of other players will be running this position through computers, checking out what's going on. But it's clear that Christopher Yu um, had to research this position better because Svirch played d5 and that is not an accurate move. It's been played before, but it's not the best move. It allows this bishop into the game. Now, this is a scary position because these knights are very loose. They're loose octopuses, basically. 
but now an excellent move from black. Taking a kind of automatic move would certainly give white some play. Knight is attacked, let's say queen here. Knight and bishop exchanged. This knight is loose, black can save it like this. But white has play here. This pawn is going to drop and white's pieces are more active. But instead of that, instead of exchanging bishops here, bishop c5 played. Very good move. Now, if bishops are exchanged, now it's very difficult to tackle these octopuses. You know, this, this bishop is attacked, for example. It's, it's really not easy. So, Svirac played bishop d4. So, this knight is attacked. Rook e8, defending the knight. Rook e3, wants to put more pressure on the knight. Queen d7. Now, amazingly, there's been a game played from exactly this position previously. Um, in fact, Kevlish Vili against Firuz Char from Reykjavik 2019. So, I have a feeling Christopher Yu would have known that. And check this with his computer. In fact, the computer is quite optimistic about Black's chances here. But Svirch had not done his homework so well. Rook c1. And rook e7. One thing is coming to the end of a computer line. And another thing is understanding it and knowing how to play from there. So let's see. Queen e2. Pressure here, rook e8, everything is holding together. I mean, this actually looks very scary. You know, can black get away with this? White's major piece is tripled here. The moment that knight is supported, but it can't move because the rook is hanging. So you just played king f8. So quite a cool move. Just making sure that now one, two, three pieces defending that rook. So shortly it will be possible to move that knight. Bishop F, excuse me, Bishop C2 attacking the knight, which was supported by the pawn. So now it's getting really sharp because you know that leaves squares behind it. Whenever you advance a pawn, it creates weaknesses behind the pawn but so it's quite quite a scary move to play actually you have to really be aware of what you're doing but actually this is fine for black now if this is exchanged off and here knight g5 looks a little bit worrying you know, maybe this queen could enter the game as well. But knight d3 is an excellent move. Attacking the rook. And after c4, that is a beautiful octopus on d3. This pawn is going to drop. Black is doing very well. So... I think one of the big themes in this position is can that knight on b4 actually enter the game successfully or is it just going to be stranded there bishops exchanged and now knight g5 so this one threatens to come in rook is threatened rook takes pawn takes but actually black has things under control the knight did reach e6 but this is only a temporary octopus. Knight takes d5 and you see the support is gone. And the knight has to go backwards. So what's the score? Black is still a pawn up. And more than that, these pieces look very strong, very powerful. That pawn is threatened. 
Queen here defends the knight. Knight takes pawn. Now black is two pawns up. Yep. Check. Yeah, a little bit scary, but no problem. King is actually safe enough on f8. Rook takes. And here's the point. Queen takes knight. And that's a very nasty pin. Black is just winning. If king f8, if king f2, then f4 wins the rook. Pin and win. And queen a3 plays in the game. B4. End of the game. The queen will have to move and then next turn. Black takes the rook. So a very convincing victory from Christopher Yu. Excellent preparation. Uh, you know, it's quite scary that the, these young kids, you know, they understand technology extremely well and they also understand how to use this computing power. You know, we all have these strong computers available to us to, to work on chess, but you have to know how to use the machines very well and he's obviously doing that. Um, and then after that, still a very tricky position, but I think you consolidated extremely well and avoided lots of tricky tactics as well. So that meant that Christopher Yu finished with five and a half out of 13, um, 12th out of 14 players, a decent debut, I would say, in the US Championship. You know, he's only 15. Um, but clearly he's making strides. So we have at the top, Caruana eight, eight and a half, Robson eight, then Liang and Dominguez on seven and a half, and then Xiong, So, Shanklin, Sevian and Niemann on seven. Gee, Hans Niemann played a very interesting game in the last round, uh, but fi finally burnt out to a draw. But uh, that's uh, worth looking at. Thanks very much for watching uh, my coverage of the US Championship. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have and you'd like to support the channel, then do subscribe. You can also support us uh, via PayPal and via Patreon as well. And check out the rewards you get on Patreon too. Thank you for watching.